Hello, everyone. I'm Felice Fryer. I'm a healthcare reporter and um, president of AHCJ's board. This webinar is the third in a series of four sponsored by the Peterson Milbank Program for Sustainable Healthcare Costs to brief health journalists on efforts being made to control the upward spiral of healthcare costs in the United States. Today's topic is what states are doing to boost primary care. Why are we talking about primary care? Because it's essential and it's in trouble. Primary care is the basic care we all need to stay healthy throughout our lives, from routine checkups to management of chronic illness. It's the care you receive from your regular doctor's office, if you're lucky enough to have one. Lots of research shows that primary care leads to better overall health, fewer hospital visits, and lower rates of chronic disease. And yet, less than 5% of healthcare dollars in the United States goes to primary care. And physicians in primary care fields, which are family medicine, pediatrics, and general internal medicine, are among the lowest paid doctors in this country. The pipeline of new primary care doctors is vastly inadequate to replace all the physicians who are retiring or simply burning out. That's why you can't get an appointment, why no one can see you now. What can be done? Today, we will hear some answers from Christopher Kohler, president of the Millbank Memorial Fund and publisher of the Millbank Quarterly, Diane Rittenhouse, senior fellow at Mathematica and professor of family medicine and health policy at UCSF, and Matthew Probst, a physician assistant and primary care provider and director of rural engagement for the University of New Mexico Office of Community Health. So I'm going to ask each of our uh, panelists to present an overview, and then we will take your questions. You can start putting questions in at any time by typing in them into the Q&A space, not the chat, please. Use the Q&A. Okay, um, Chris, why don't you start us off? Thank you, uh, Felice. Uh, folks should see first set of slides now. Um, I'm going to assume yes until someone says no. Um, my job here, I really appreciate uh, Felice's introduction, is, is to set the stage for um, what can be done. Um, I am having a problem with advancing the slides, and I don't see it here. So I'm going to stop the share for a moment and go in a different way. Uh, okay. I'm sorry, folks. This is all right. Felice, you want to vamp for a little bit? I'm gonna do. I'm gonna change one thing. Vamp. And then I'm gonna... <laughs> yeah. All right. Oh um, let's see. We tested this all out beforehand. You wanna? And... How about um, maybe Diane can can dive no, in? No, no. I'm oh, gonna. I'm oh. gonna get it. Okay. You guys see it? Yep. Um, I can make this work. Okay. There we go. How's that? Did we advance the slides? All right. I apologize yes. that you got the banner at the top, but it'll still get the message across. So this is who the Millbank Memorial Fund is. We're an endowed operating foundation. If folks on the call are familiar with the Commonwealth Fund, we are a sibling to the Commonwealth Fund. We focus particularly on state health policies and um, our focus is on improving population health and health equity. My own background, I've been president of the fund for 11 years. Before that, I was the health insurance commission in Rhode Island regulating commercial health insurance, where we did a lot of things related to primary care and trying to strengthen primary care, some of which we'll talk about here today. Um, my job in this is to sort of tee up the, Felice talked about the problem. Um, uh, uh, by the way, a lot of the information that she cited, the facts can be found at Millbank's website. We have a primary care scorecard that has a lot of information. Some of it for you who are um, working in particular communities. Um, we have state specific data, so you can look up a lot of information on primary care there. Uh, in terms of what can be done, I had the good fortune of serving on um, the a committee sponsored by the National Academy of Science, Engineering and Medicine on implementing high quality primary care, which really looked at comprehensively what should be done to address um, the, the, 
the, the weakening of primary care in the face of its fundamental importance. And I think Felice framed it exactly right. How it's experienced by your readers is why can't I see my doctor? And that's the, um, rather than talk about what's behind that, we're going to talk about what some of the solutions are. Um, this is what the committee was charged to do. The report was released at the end of 21, and it continues to guide both federal and state policy that um, Diane and Matt are going to speak to. The fundamental thing and, and principle that um, uh, the report um, focused on is this idea that primary care is a common good. It is the only service, healthcare service, where an increased presence is associated with improved population health. There is data to show that the more primary care you have, the longer life expectancy is in particular communities. And like other common goods, whether it's water, um, land, that requires public policy oversight and monitoring. We're not going to be able to innovate our way out of the problem that Felice described, and that requires strong advocacy, organized leadership, public awareness to advance evidence-based policies. The report, and this is where I'm going to get a little bit more specific about this from the state standpoint, identified five basic areas that need to be addressed if we're going to strengthen primary care. We have to change the way the primary care is paid. I'm going to talk about each of these in a little bit more detail. We have to ensure that high quality primary care is available to everybody. We have to pay attention to the workforce and how it's trained. Matt's going to speak to that. We have to pay attention to the IT that supports it. And then we have to um, hold systems accountable, including the government, for ensuring that these policies are recommended. What I'm going to do is go through specific recommendations, but talk about the ones that are in italics are ones that have a particular state piece, since the focus here is on what states can do to strengthen primary care. The most fundamental recommendation that the committee came up with is that payers, whether that's Medicaid, Medicare, or insurers, should change the way the primary care is paid, fundamentally pay primary care more and pay it differently based on their ability to deliver high primary care, not because it's going to save money in the short term. High quality primary care is a good in and of itself. If we want to save money in healthcare, there's a lot easier places to save money. We need primary care because it improves life expectancy, population health, and health equity. Um, uh, Medicaid agencies, Action 1.2, um, Medicare and commercial insurers should change the way that they pay primary care. We're not going to get into too much on that unless people want to talk about it in the recommendations. Um, all payers, Action 3, need to pay attention to that 5% figure. That means one out of every $20 in the U.S. is going to primary care. That compares to 10 or 11 in other healthcare systems, and we need to change that. And then there's a role for states to make sure that Medicaid, commercial, and Medicare are making these changes in a coordinated way so the providers are seeing consistent signals. The second area is around access. And primary care is fundamentally about a relationship. The portion of people who report having access to a usual source of care is actually declining. Um, Three in 10 people now report that they don't have access to a usual source of care. And we know that people with a usual source of care are healthier. They go to the ER less, they have better care of chronic conditions, they are treated with more respect and dignity. So we've got to start emphasizing that, that, that people are entitled to it and people should commit to it. And there's a role for the payers and there's a role for the state in doing that. We need to create more community health centers, the baseline kind of the safety net for our primary care system. Um, CMS and Medicaid need to make sure that Medicaid and Medicare beneficiaries can access high quality primary care by how their benefits are developed and what they hold their health plans. You hear about Medicare Advantage and Medicaid MCOs. The, the, it's public money. We should be holding those payers accountable for that. And then these other recommendations related to COVID and COVID, excuse me, and related to how we get consumers involved in directing their care. The third area is around how we train primary care teams. A lot of that training money comes from Medicare um, in the graduate medical education, but Medicaid spends a lot of money on um, training as well. And they, they should be more attentive to how that money is spent. It makes no sense that we're training our primary care clinicians to be extra hands in hospitals, which is really what we're doing right now. We know that if we train them 
in community settings, they deliver primary care, they stay in those settings, they stay in those communities, and we should make sure that our public training funds go to support that. In terms of HIT, um, no specific recommendations for states there, just to point out that the electronic revolution, healthcare revolution that was supposed to make a clinician's lives simpler has not. Most of that action is at the federal level, not at the state level. And then in terms of accountability, I wanna call attention to this third action, the idea that primary care advocates can organize at the state level to advance state policies to improve primary care, often using state level high quality primary care scorecards. Um, Diane is gonna speak a little bit to some uh, action in some states doing that. Um, who knew that this work could be so complicated? There is a, a balance between state policy and federal policy. The focus today is on state work there, but Medicare has to move, particularly Medicare's federal policy has to move um, in tandem with that. And so while we're talking about state policy, it recognizes that the role of Medicare is very important in this. But today we're focusing particularly on the states because as journalists, you often work in particular communities can, and can ask what your states are doing. Um, I hope that gives an overview of sort of some of the big level policy recommendations. How that's rolling out in particular states in urban and in rural settings is what we're going to spend um, the rest of the hour discussing. Thanks a lot. Great. Thank you, Chris. Diane, you're up. You are muted. You are muted. Can you hear me now? Yes. Oh, wonderful. Thank you. Thanks for the introduction, Felice, and thanks, um, Chris, for that great presentation and overview of what came out of the um, National Academies of Science, Engineering, and Medicine, or NASM. I'm going to talk for a few minutes about what states are doing to strengthen primary care, and um, I've included some examples of progress in payment and a Sorry, I've included some examples of progress in payment and accountability and workforce that um, Chris mentioned, and a few general and a few that are more specific to California. So you can see how some of the work at the state level is aligned with these recommendations that Chris described. And then I'm going to talk about a recent summit that we had in California and a report that lays out a bit of a roadmap for primary care policies um, in California. Um, by way of introduction, I'm a senior fellow at Mathematica and a professor of um, family medicine and health policy at UCSF, and um, um, I'm really pleased to have the opportunity to talk about these issues with you today. So with regard to payment, that was one of the categories that Chris talked about, um, and it was a, one of the recommendations out of the report that he was discussing, that we increase the proportion of total health care spending that goes to primary care. So um, over 20 states have passed laws to measure spending on primary care because until we start to measure this, we don't know. Um, and then other states have actually um, passed laws to set targets or to actually place a statutory requirement on health plans or others to increase primary care spending. Um, and you can see these states here. Um, estimates of primary care spending vary by state. Each state has its own method of figuring this out and um, their own definitions, but generally the estimates range from 3 to 10% of total healthcare spending that goes to primary care, which we think is much too low, as Chris mentioned, in terms of building a, a solid foundation of high quality primary care for the healthcare system. Uh, another comment with regard to payment, this is simply an example, but I wanted to remind everyone that the Federal Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services, or CMS, um, their Innovation Center, or CMMI, has been testing primary care models for several years, such as Comprehensive Primary Care, Comprehensive Primary Care Plus, Primary Care First. You may have heard of some of these. Um, there's a one in Maryland called the Maryland Primary Care Program. And they're building over time on the learnings from each of these, um, these programs, these demonstrations. The Making Care Primary Model is a 10 and a half year multi-payer model launched this year. So it's just getting started. But it's particularly interesting and worth mentioning here because it requires participating states to directionally align with their Medicaid agencies to signal collective movement away from fee-for-service 
toward population-based payments for primary care, which is what Chris was mentioning. We not only need to pay more, which is what the prior slide was talking about, getting more of the healthcare dollar to go towards primary care, but we also need to pay differently. And this is a way to, um, to begin to move away from fee-for-service and meet practices where they are and help them along. Um, in terms of accountability, so a different topic um, or category that, that Chris mentioned, um, the NASM group said that we need to track progress over time. So they said we've had other reports on primary care with recommendations about how to improve the primary care infrastructure in the United States, and we have seen little progress. And so they really emphasized accountability um, over time, and that this recommendation came to have a federal scorecard that that helps us know how how progress what track progress over time. And um, there is a federal scorecard under um, in the works, but in the meantime, the Millbank Memorial Fund stepped in. And um, there are to do a national scorecard that Chris mentioned at the beginning of the call, which is available um, on their website. And um, several other states have taken the initiative to develop scorecards that talk about, these are not about judging primary care physicians on whether or not they're taking care of hypertension or that kind of thing. This is really about how we as a nation or a state are, are supporting the infrastructure around primary care that's so essential. So to what extent are we investing in um, the payment, spending, workforce, access, research, and IT, the things that, that um, NASM thought were so important. And the goals of these scorecards are, are um, to identify and communicate policy problems, to organize and inspire communities and policymakers to work together to improve the primary care infrastructure, and to monitor changes in the quality of the primary care infrastructure over time. So I wanted to highlight some recent progress in California specifically, and this is back to payment and the recommendation of the um, the NASM report. We have in California a new Office of Healthcare Affordability to address the issue um, that so many people in California are facing about the affordability of healthcare. And as part of that, the, the statute um, requires them to, to address spending growth. So part of their goal is to slow spending growth in California. Part of it is to promote high value in healthcare in California. And then they have a, a piece that's to assess market consolidation, which we know is a big um, issue in the healthcare delivery ecosystem. Um, the, the, this new office, which goes by OCA, Office of Healthcare Affordability, um, has established very public and transparent processes that include a wide range of stakeholders and big deal here in bold and green at the top. Um, they set in October, so just a few weeks ago, a statewide primary care spending benchmark of 15% of total medical expenses. So the idea is that measured across all payers, lines of business and product types by 2034. So there's a 10 year lead into this. Um, and they're gonna publish annual reports that include these analyses of primary care spending and performance uh, uh, against the benchmarks. Um, and you can see that they have other areas on the slide here for promoting high value that they're looking at, which have to do with behavioral health investment, um, alternative payment model adoption. So again, paying differently, quality and equity performance, and then the workforce stability, making sure that as we set these um, spending targets for the state and we invest more in primary care, that we maintain a stable workforce and we um, continue to improve quality and equity in the state. Another issue that I wanted to talk about that's happening in California has to do with workforce. And there's been a major, just major public and private efforts to expand the health workforce in California. And a big emphasis has been on primary care, understanding that the primary care workforce is depleted, burned out, and um, under-resourced. And um, we know that nearly four in 10 Californians live in a primary care shortage area. And there was a commission that was set up in 2019, so about five years ago, that um, focused had one of their focus areas was primary care, but it was 
a commission of senior leaders across multiple sectors, including health, education, employment, labor, and government. It was co-chaired by the University of California president at the time, Janet Napolitano, and Dignity Health president and CEO, Lloyd Dean. And they released a final set of recommendations um, in 2019 aimed at improving the ability of California's health workforce to meet the changing needs of the state's diverse population. That landed on the desk of um, Governor Newsom when he came into office and has served as a as sort of a blueprint for a workforce a health workforce strategy for the state, California's office responsible for health workforce was elevated to a department. It was given quite a bit of funding, um, and it aims to expand and diversify the health workforce with an emphasis on serving Medicaid or Medi-Cal in California, and people in medically underserved areas. And over the past five years, state leaders have allocated more than $4.3 billion to at least 16 state agencies and departments to recruit, educate, train, and retain new and existing health professionals. And we can talk if you want <clears throat> about some of the high priority investments made by the state um, uh, in these recent times. I want to uh, spend the remaining slides to talk about a a primary care policy summit that we held in California. Um, I facilitated this. It was it was a joint a partnership between Mathematica and the California Healthcare Foundation, um, who sponsored this activity. And the idea was that given that primary care is essential to improving population health and advancing health equity, we wanted to bring together a group, and it was about 30 health policy experts, including primary care providers, state officials, consumer advocates, community leaders, and patient representatives, to reach consensus on primary care policy priorities for California and to catalyze collaborative action on these policies. So the next few slides are just about the recommendations that came out of this summit. And um, part of what was recognized in this effort was that um, to really position that, that primary care in and of itself, as Chris mentioned, is the only area of healthcare that is going to improve population health the more that you really invest in it, and that it should be a common good. And recognizing the flip side of the coin that there is work to be done within primary care to strengthen it, given that it's been so under-resourced for so many years and the infrastructure is so weak. So the recommendations that came out of this were to, to um, there were three foundational policies. I'll talk through those. Um, there were 10 policy uh, priority recommendations specific to five areas of impact that I'll list out. And if we want to go into them, we can. And then a three-part approach to increasing leadership and accountability. And I just want to say that this report was aimed at multiple actors. So the idea is not that this is all for one government agency to resolve or simply to land on the health plans or um, purchasers or payers. This is really something that that people across the state need to come together uh, to work towards common goals to, to strengthen primary care. So the three foundational policy recommendations, and these were really felt to underlie everything else, were number one, that we need to um, increase Medi-Cal provider payment uh, primary care provider payments so that we don't have financial disincentives to serve Californians with low incomes. One third of Californians are on Medi-Cal. And so um, it's important that we have, that we sustainably increase what we pay to people who are taking care of Medi-Cal patients. Um, we also, number two was to increase the proportion of healthcare spending directed toward primary care. And that one we've already talked about, there's been some progress. And in October, we set the 15% goal in California. And then third, to create meaningful engagement of people with lived experiences of discrimination in policymaking and governance body bodies. So these three things were sort of seen as foundational to strengthening primary care in the state. And then the 10 policy priorities that emerged through this, this broad consensus process um, are listed here and really range from connecting primary care practices and community-based organizations to reducing debt for primary care professionals, to expanding community health centers in areas with primary care shortages, uh, improving data exchange, implementing alternative payment models, or paying differently as we discussed earlier. 
And finally, I'll leave you on this um, three-part approach that was recommended to, to increase leadership and accountability. And this comes straight out of the, the um, National Academies report that uh, Chris was talking about. And we reached broad consensus that we should pursue this in California um, uh, as a collective, that this would be a good, uh, uh, a good vision for California. And one is to have a state scorecard like uh, New York and Massachusetts and Virginia have done, um, put together a task force on primary care and consider an office for primary care with in-state government so that there's someone who wakes up every day with in-state government and thinks about primary care and how to strengthen it um, to advance um, population health and, and health equity for all. And that's it. Thank you, excellent. Matt, tell us about what you're doing in New Mexico. All right, and great segue from my partners here. Um, you know, so much um, overlap um, in terms of the challenges. Yes, there are unique uh, challenges that we all face, but so many um, of the uh, the core components are similar. And then, you know, it, now we get to in the trenches, if you will, um, the solutions. And so, yeah, I'm Matt Probst, Director of Rural Engagement. You know, I put up this first picture here. You know, we talk about shortage areas and everything's relative, right? And, and um, you know, New Mexico is a very rural state and I'm just a good old country boy when it comes down to that. So that's a picture of me with my first best friend, Shaker. I put it up on purpose. Um, adverse childhood experiences is something that I want to just mention. And so, you know, I was a kid with nine out of 10 adverse childhood experiences. And, um, you know, it just leaves a little bit of mystery. I wonder which one Matt doesn't have. Um, <laughs> but, you know, based on data, you know, there were some that would say, well, that would destine Matt to be dead or in prison. But here I am. And um, thanks to being provided opportunity. So I'll mention that as I'll go. And, you know, for folks that used to think I would kill myself on this horse riding bareback as fast as it would take me, that was the safest place on this planet. And still, you know, when I'm threatened and, you know, through counseling and all of that in visualization, you know, when, when I feel that I put myself in visualization on Shaker's back and, and I know I'm safe. Mm -hmm. So New Mexico hub and spoke the, the innovations and what the states are doing. I'm going to highlight one specific prop, prop project here. So this is a, a project to expand primary care. Um, and really, what does that mean? Primary care? I will just say, you know, working for the Office for Community Health, I would always say, you know, click the box as a physician assistant that I was family medicine. But really, well, the way I understand it now is it's community medicine. And in that community medicine, that that definition that, you know, I get to work for Dr. Art Kaufman, who is, you know, in all the early literature around social determinants of health or uh, created all that early stuff. You know, he's my mentor. And, you know, now we call it social drivers of health. But the, the emphasis is that 20% of what we do in the primary care clinic impacts health outcomes. And 80% of that is outside the clinic and access to vital services. And so, you know, the more rural we get, the tougher it is. So this is in Wagon Mound, New Mexico, uh, the picture here. And this is one of 22 spoke sites for three hub spot sites. So a total of 25 school-based health centers using this model to expand to these rural and frontier communities, uh, not just you know medical and behavioral health care, but education, social drivers as we call them, and workforce opportunities. It, you know, innovation comes from necessity and we can't innovate our way out of it, but so much of the time it's just look at history and go back to what works when you're under pressure. So we all experienced the pandemic together. And, um, you know, what came after that for my community was the greatest disaster in New Mexico history, the Hermit's Peak Calf Canyon fire in April of 2022. Both things led to displacement. You know, you're stuck at home, you can't go to school, you can't go to, you know, just changes in, in things or you're evacuated. And, you know, ongoing flooding still causes that in our burn area and our burn scar. And so in that, looking at, well, what other ways can we deliver healthcare? So um, what did we do in New Mexico? Some of the things that Diana just put up, we, we have, um, you know, the primary care council. And so I was appointed to the primary care council, looked at, you know, what's our mission to realize primary care and 
how by providing timely access to care to every New Mexico and timely, you know, defined as within 24 hours. Well, that's a jump um, and a novel idea, but how do we get there? And so um, Secretary Scrace at the time when, when was the secretary when he appointed me to this council, you know, in front of the legislature and, and Senator Campos pictured here said, perhaps the greatest tool we currently have to meet that is school-based health centers. So, you know, what do rural communities have? Not all of them have hospitals, we know that. Not all of them even have clinics or public health offices, but they all have schools. And so using places where kids come together as access points to healthcare was the main point. So we created the Primary Care Council and payment reform, you know, mission number one in New Mexico, uh, absolutely. But then also putting the state putting its money where its mouth, mouth is with the Rural Healthcare Delivery Fund. We're now over $120 million um, since this legislation has been enacted of projects specifically for rural health back to equity and where the greatest need is in terms of shortage areas uh, uh, for agencies that have, you know, ideas and processes in place to expand that access and move that dial of access for every New Mexican. Uh, you know, the mega ACE, so adverse childhood experiences, uh, Dr. Massaro was the, the medical director for the Department of Health at the time, and he would call COVID the mega ACE, right? We know what our ACEs are, those, those 10 ACEs. COVID being the mega, mega ACE. And as the data came out at the federal level, as you all are probably aware, you know, that the, the harm that it did to, to youth across America. And so one of the responses was expand school-based health centers. And so this is us at, at the national meeting here. You know, a lot of folks passionate about that. But the basics down in the slide there on your bottom right, you know, funding for the operation of school-based health centers would provide quality primary, preventative, and mental health care to children and adolescents nationwide in an accessible, familiar, and convenient setting. So how do we do that in New Mexico Hub and Spoke? Well, uh, you know, we use evidence-based practices. And the core of that of... Uh, what I call provider extenders, um, but also social drivers is the community health worker. And so that's the other thing that we've done in New Mexico is make community health worker services billable. And so, you know, the old models that I, I, I helped to originally develop were about using community health workers to extend um, my reach as a primary care provider to help me fill my schedule, if you will, and my behavioral health colleagues. And that's still true today. Um, that they can be my human presence, uh, that from an evidence-based perspective, you know, they're better at. They're better at connecting to the community socially and linguistically and culturally than physicians are. And so utilizing their connection to these rural communities um, as an access point. But now also back to those 80% of the work outside of the primary care clinic, being able to be reimbursed for their work for social determinants of health drivers. And so this is a, there's a little link up there at the top to the provider's documentary. You know, if a picture's worth a thousand words, a movie's worth a million. So that's a documentary about rural health care in America that myself and Tiffany here are featured in. And that clip, PBS Learning Media made a resource guide for high school, for high schools. And this clip specifically takes the one to health careers. Um, and so Tiffany's still working and she's a, a lead community health worker for us at our school out in, in the Valley. And through that extension of Hub and Spoke, these are our patient visits. You can see this one hub clinic where I'm sitting today at West Las Vegas High School. You can see the difference that it's made. And, you know, we'll see what this school year does. But I, I you know, I, I believe it's going to be closer to a thousand patient visits this year um, in terms of measuring access for medical and behavioral health care. Circuit riding, so just good old fashioned country medicine. You know, um, so many of my patients call me doc and I am not, I am a physician assistant, but no matter how many times I try and tell them that, they say, but you're my doc. Uh, that being said, you know, I would also say that you could call me doc, not because of my medical care, but because I'm a little bit outlaw like doc holiday. So turn it back in time to what Las Vegas, New Mexico looked like, you know, before all the innovation. And it was, you know, just that that good old fashioned country dog, you know, driving, you know, riding around on his horse and 
seeing people at, you know, whatever the saloon, the, the post office, the, you know, you know, the school, uh, you know, those types of locations. And so this is meeting people where they literally physically are, not just in terms of, you know, stages of behavioral change, meeting people where they are, but also meeting people where they are physically in these geographic isolated locations, many of which there are no clinic facilities, you know, and so that's it. This here to the right. So I don't ride a horse. I do ride horses, but I drive a Subaru and uh, you'll see me out doing circuit riding. Yesterday I was in Raton, New Mexico. This picture is of me in Pecos, New Mexico. And, you know, <sighs> diseases of despair, you know, it's our greatest enemy across America now. Um, but, um, you know, this group of me with the wrestlers, uh, in Pecos, New Mexico, you know, they lost their coach who I was once his primary care provider when he was a young college wrestler to suicide. And we lost two high school mm -hmm. coaches, just, uh, two, three weeks apart in our little County to suicide and the ripple effect of what that has done in devastation to our youth. So providing them access at their school for care. You know, not just in sports injuries, but that leads to so many times on a sideline or mat side, you know, now we talk, start talking about what's really going on. Because as Chris said, primary care is a relationship. So, you know, the, the, the coolest thing that, you know, people get excited about is the high tech component of this. So in the provider documentary, I was uh, during that time on kind of uh, tour for uh, screenings across the nation, I was introduced to this this, you know, novel idea of telehealth that was, you know, NASA had developed these kiosks that were going to allow, you know, physicians on Earth to take care of astronauts in space, you know, and not just, you know, talk to them on a telephone, but, you know, uh, but or look at them across a video screen, but be able to actually listen to their heart and lungs and look in their eyes and use a dermoscope, do an EKG, do an ultrasound, you know, from Earth. And so the idea became if it can work for astronauts in space, can, it can work in these frontier communities. And so that's what we've implemented. And back to that timely access of care, as a circuit rider, 25 clinics across 22,000 square miles, I can't get to everybody very often, but through my community health workers, extending me and through this technology now, you know, every day that there's school, I can be delivering healthcare with objective findings, better quality healthcare. So it's made a big difference. Um, sorry, you know, yes, improving that timely access, you know, not just a school based health center on a Monday and lucky if you're sick on Monday, but every day the schools open, you know, under uh, overcome those transportation barriers uh, that are such a challenge for these rural communities and dangerous roads and, you know, storms. Uh, so there's that component, you know, just overall enhance the quality with objective findings, not just video, you know, visual or audio. Um, and, and really this piece of empowering the financial viability. So before rural school-based health centers, you know, one of our schools, it's K through 12, 28 students. So to send me, you know, 90 minutes away to see patients there, you're lucky if, you know, one or two kids get sick a day and need me. But this way, if you can put a lot of those communities together, you know, 10 of those communities with one or two students, now you're making best use of my time. And so it's created a viability model through Hub and Spoke for these agencies to expand the healthcare and then reduce the windshield time of having me out on the road or my behavioral health colleagues. So workforce, uh, you know, Semia is the salud, that seeds of health. It's your grow, our grow your own workforce program that I founded in 2008. And it's worked per capita as a county here. We grow more health professionals in New Mexico than any uh, county. And that is because we take young kids interested in health cares and we mentor them with, with health career clubs. And not just mentor them, but make them experts on cer certain topics, might be suicide, might be heart health, might be you know, whatever the topic is of interest, and we make them peer health educators. And we don't just wait for them to get, you know, graduate and get licensed and credentialed. We put them to work right away in their schools as peer health educators and really help expand that that reach and that upstream approach of creating changing norms of what health is and healthy behaviors. And so it's made a big difference. Uh, you know, a, a friend of mine says, if you replace the I in illness with we, you have wellness. 
And so that's it. And it's really just a pyramid scheme. You know, I sold prepaid legal insurance to put myself through through PA school. Well, this is the same thing. We're just not taking people's money. We're using it to spread health in communities where we lack resources and enough licensed providers. And then the last thing I would say is the school-based health centers on campuses. So that was the start, but then now social determinants of health. And so we have the Grace Youth and Family Center is where my school-based health center is located. Lots of rural schools have shrinking populations and they have square footage in their facilities. So creating through a community school model an access point for social drivers for our youth to give them that opportunity. I no longer fo focus on ACEs. I focus on childhood opportunity index, trying to move that data of providing youth opportunity. So this, our center here is named after Grace. She was not an at-risk student. She was a three-time state cheerleading champion. She died at 19 years of age of a fentanyl overdose. And that's the reality of what we're dealing with for our youth and for our families. And so the link there tells more about her story there on YouTube as told by her wonderful mother. Uh, but here on campus, not just health careers, but all careers. We have CDL classes for high school students. We have culinary arts. We have the trades and welding and on and on and on, you know, opportunities for youth to be able to be successful um, in their home communities. Youth mentoring programs, uh, uh, the idea here, food security programs. Uh, the idea here with all of these programs is to provide this service beyond just education at the school and beyond the school hours, summers, evenings, and weekends. So we feed, feed kids dinner, you know, those types of models um, right here on campus for them. So that's an example of what's working here at home and, uh, you know, so many challenges, but I think the commonality you hear from us all is that there are solutions. They're not going to happen if we just keep doing the same stuff or we don't do anything. So uh, if, if anything that I've put out here with the princess, my current equine best friend and therapy animal, um, if any of these sound of interest, feel free to contact me at this number and email address. Thank you, Matt. That's great. So um, if there are any questions, um, we, we are at the moment where we can take questions. Please put them in the Q&A not the chat, and um, I will pose them. And I have my own questions, and I'd actually like to go back to Chris. Um, I'm wondering what you think of um, this proposal in California to require 15%, and it sounds a little similar to what you did in Rhode Island. Can you tell us what happened there and whether you have any advice for California and rolling this out? Sure, um, and I'll, um, yeah, uh, there is a direct thread from um, what uh, you referred to and what Diane referred to, that 15% spend target and um, uh, what we're doing in Rhode Island. Um, I, When I was health insurance commissioner in Rhode Island, that was the job I had before I was at Millbank. I had an unusual mandate in that I was to direct commercial insurers to improve healthcare affordability. I had had the experience of being uh, of, uh, as I ran a health plan before this, a Medicaid health plan, and I had negotiated with the Matts and the Dianes of the world. And I love them. I love the work that they did. I wanted to give Matt more money so that he could go and do the cool stuff in the community. I want to give Diane money so that she could form her relationships. But I didn't have any because I'd already been held up by large providers who had, frankly, more economic and more negotiating power than Matt and Diane. And I had to pay them first. And as a result, I had crumbs left over for Matt and Diane. So when I became, and, and the health plans know this, the health plans get the value of primary care, but they were unable to change what was our market failure. And so when um, uh, the Office of the Health Insurance Commission was established, we actually, with the, with the health plan's consent, said, you know what? We've measured, you're spending about 5% on primary care. That number should be higher. Um, you need to raise that portion, the portion of your expenses going to primary care, and you can point to us as the bad guy. You can say no to the consolidated providers that they have to live with a, a 2% increase as opposed to the 5 or 6% that they want so that you can give more money to the Mats and Dianes of the world. Um, what's happened in Rhode Island is that they've raised their number from, it was about 5 or 6, they've now got it at 10.5. Um, I can't say that 
all the primary care physicians are completely happy in Rhode Island that everyone has access to usual source of care. We do have more primary care docs per capita in Rhode Island, or primary care clinicians, excuse me, Matt, I'm including NPs and PAs in that, than other places. And it is a less inhospitable environment for primary care than it is in other places. But um, that doesn't mean it's good. It might be that that number has to be higher. It might be that we have to work on Medicaid. In, Matt, in New Mexico, uh, in addition to what you've talked about, I've talked to the folks in New Mexico. Medicaid is now paying their primary care clinicians the same that Medicare pays, which is very unusual. At least that's my understanding. And so you need much bigger reforms than just in commercial health insurance. But for California, the fifth biggest economy in the world, I think, Diane, to put a, a, a stake in the ground and say we need to rebalance our healthcare system to focus more on primary care, I think is really significant. I would say, Felice, it's important. These are targets. There is not a, a requirement mechanism. And the next step is going to be to require it, whether that it's the federal government or the, the state government, whether you do that through insurance or through the healthcare systems. But targets is sort of the first step. If they fail the targets, then what they're going to move to is to move to something that's more binding with it. But we've we clearly, to Matt's point, we clearly have to do something different here. Um, or, or we're going to have fewer and fewer people with access to primary care and more folks who can afford it buying out and buying the concierge care. And the rest of us are going to be stuck um, looking for friends who can get us in <laughs> if we can find them. Yeah, <laughs> that's still going on. Um, so I wanted to ask you about one other thing you mentioned, Chris. You said that you don't want to talk about um, investing in primary care as a way to save money. Uh, and I want to say, why not? Why wouldn't it save money? Because if I want to save money in healthcare, I got a lot better places to save it. Hospitals are getting paid two and a half times in the commercial setting um, from uh, uh, what Medicare is paying them. Um, we pay up to twice, Medicare pays twice as much for a service, depending on whether it's delivered in a hospital or someplace else. So they're much more effective, quick, or overpayment of pharmaceuticals. There's much more effective, quicker ways to save money. I'm investing in primary care. Yes, over time, we're going to save money for it. But if I want to save money fast, there's a lot better places I can go that are sure. I'm investing in primary care to do the kind of work that Matt talks about. You know, when, you, when, you, when you're facing deaths of despair, what you're facing is a lack of hope in communities. And a reliable source of care, someone who can talk to you about what's going on, who can diagnose your problems, that's going to rebuild that trust, give hope instead of despair. That's why we're investing in primary care, not because it's going to save a, a look, it's only 5% of the spend. You know, you get, well, like I said, let's go after pharmaceuticals, let's go after the inflated hospital payments before we start expecting Diane and Matt to save the whole system a bunch of money. All right, we have some questions coming in, even though um, I have questions, I'm going <laughs> to defer to our audience. So uh, first question, there's been a lot of discussion and debate in states over whether giving more practice authority to NPs and ex expanding and supporting NPs, nurse practitioners, in primary care is one way to improve access. Can you comment on how much this is part of the conversation and what the challenges are? Who wants to tackle that? Maybe Matt, since... Sure. Well, you know, so one of the things we have going on here, I didn't mention, but we have a rural residency planning grant. And so we need more rural residencies because the point is, you know, grow them where they are. As Chris said, they're, they're much more likely to practice there later, right, where they have their roots uh, and they feel called to serve their communities. And so, you know, the, the uh, uh, I would just say that the models of, of training for nurse practitioners versus physicians or PAs, even like myself, where I where I had to go on campus at the you know, University of New Mexico School of Medicine, there's a lot more online training, which allows for, you know, registered nurses that are like, you know, you know what, I'm ready to become a provider too. I want, I, I can do this myself. I want to do those procedures. I want to, you know, prescribe the medications for them to still be able to work and go to online school. I have one with me in the clinic today. She's our school nurse, but she's doing her clinical rotation with us here in the clinic. So back to these challenges that we have on workforce, the point is we need to do them all. You know, we need to expand residency programs. We need to expand, 
you know, the, all of it. And it's the entire healthcare team. And, and, and that's, you know, physician assistants and nurse practitioners and community health workers and the whole gamut, behavioral health, social work, you know, all of those health professions, that's what it's going to take. And so, you know, I once did a presentation on workforce for the New Mexico Healthcare Workforce Committee, and I used a pie graph and I showed, you know, basically I'm just a good old country boy. My grandma had taught me how to make pies. Listen, we have all this crust but we only have throw it all in there we only have this much filling it fills up 40 percent of the pie why are we arguing about who can do it best right now if the day comes that we have more filling than crust then let's talk about who does it best in the meantime let's just all get to work and let's you know make sure we can feed everyone all right that's a good point <laughs> diane can you address that question though i mean how much when when you're talking about improving access to primary care does this issue of nurse practitioners and physician assistant is that part of the plan there sure it comes up all the time i think and in fact it's one of the high priority investments that the state of california has made um in, it has been to expand nurse practitioner scope um, I think we get caught up in primary care sometimes in in what the the question we call it turf wars um, about uh, protecting um, types of providers in primary care. And I think that Matt's point is is very well taken that there is plenty of work to go around. And in some of these settings, there. In a rural setting, particularly, for example, um, you may need a family physician or you may need a, a PA or you may need an NP who was willing to, who's from that area. We're doing a lot of work in California now thinking about recruiting people into the health workforce who are from these rural or urban underserved areas who have a better chance, they're not required, but they have a better chance of going back to those areas to serve. Um, because even though we have a large um, uh, we have a shortage of, of health workers in California. We also have a maldistribution. And so getting people who are who speak the right language or who have the right, uh, who are culturally co uh, concordant, getting them out into areas that are rural or urban underserved um, is all part of the effort. And nurse practitioners are certainly part of the solution here, I think. Great. All right, next question from... Um our viewers, how would you recommend journalists communicate the relationship between the need for primary care and the influence of money in the healthcare system? Who wants to tackle that one? <laughs> Everyone looks very no, stumped. I, no, no, I'm, I'm, I'm um, the voice of our, my communications director, the Milbank Fund's communications director. I think this is really tricky. Because on the one hand, I say, oh, pity the poor primary care physician. They're only making $180,000 a year. You know, when, when what's the figure? 60% of people are living paycheck to paycheck. That's not much, that's not worthy of much sympathy. However, when you understand that if they had checked a different box or gone for different training, they could be making three times that with a lot better hours and a lot less work then that's the choices that they're facing in front of them. So I think one way, so one way to think about it is, is salary differential, but frankly, we who work on primary care are very careful about how we talk about that because it doesn't always require a lot of sympathy. I think that the, um, uh, this, I have found the 5% figure going to primary care to be very effective. When you go out and you talk to most folks, they think that Matt and Diane are getting 20, 25% of the pie. You tell them that it's five. They have no, uh, the general public is frankly outraged. They share the concern. I think that's why you see all the states that are focusing on it. So I think that we have found that that spend figure is very appropriate. And then I do think we have to um, remind folks that fundamentally healthcare should not be a business. And I think there is a role for journalists to sort of um, remind folks how much of a business healthcare has become. And all this discussion about private equity and venture capital, they're investing in healthcare because there's money to be made. 
they're not particularly interested in helping Matt um, do better by those kids on the wrestling team. And that's a problem. I mean, I, I think we have to, I, I say that as a policy person, I would say that to journalists too, we have to bring pressure to that because that's about economic power being put to further economic power as opposed to advance the health of folks. And, and we, have to, we have to call that, frankly. A really good point. Diane, did you have something you wanted to add on this issue? Just that I think investing in primary care doesn't necessarily mean only giving primary care providers more money relative to their peers. I think it means also building out the information technology systems and data exchange systems we need, doing more research in primary care that we need, um, providing payments that allow you to hire a nurse practitioner to help build out the team or a community health worker or a clinical pharmacist to help with with complex um, older patients with chronic illness uh, manage their medications and optimize their their um, treatment so i think when we're talking about investing in primary care the problem is that um, so often in the business of medicine people are thinking about this sort of six month return on investment or quarterly return on investment. And I think that there's a real danger or it's really impossible to say, oh, we're going to invest more in primary care. And in four months, we're going to see a big return on investment. What we're talking about is investing in the health of the population and, yeah. in, and preventing a lot of downstream um, hospitalizations and illnesses that could occur. And so there will be savings overall to the total population down downstream, but it won't, you won't see it in the primary care office in a quarterly ROI kind of report. So I would, those are just some thoughts. Yeah, that's very helpful. Okay, we'll take uh, the next question. Um, we often hear about the growing administrative burden of pride, pride sorry, providing primary care, e.g. increasing in duplicative quality measures, as important in making the job, uns as, as important in making the job unsustainable as the dollar aspect. Wondering if that came up in the California report, it's not mentioned in the recommendations, the administrative burden. So that's definitely a topic. It's definitely a topic in California. It's a big concern. It creates a lot of, um, extra costs for these primary care practices that are under-resourced and a lot of extra kind of computer time at the end of the day for primary care physicians who are, um, you know, busy trying to see 30 patients and then have to spend time on the back end arguing with health plans and with insurance company or with um, uh, payers and, and uh, health plans over medications and treatments, et cetera prior auths. And so it's definitely an important issue. The um, process that we used in our summit was a group of a, a group of people came together. We had 70 priority policies. We ranked those policies and the 10 that you saw emerged with the three foundational policies and the three part leadership. That's what emerged out of that process. But that's not to say that um, growing administrative burden placed on primary care providers and practices isn't important and isn't important yeah. in California. And there isn't thought going into that. Is there any optimism that AI can ease some of that burden, or is that naive thing to say? <laughs> what, no, what that's absolutely that? that's absolutely um, an area where AI can help. Um, uh, and that's I I think where I hesitate with AI is where we say, oh, it's going to replace the relationship with the between the clinician and the patient i think people want a relationship with a human being who knows them over time and can deal with most of their problems most of the time in a continual relationship um i think that a lot of this back end administrative um prior auth etc can be dealt with and a lot of the documentation and um things can be dealt with with ai and i think we're seeing that um, next question. I'm in Arizona where concierge primary care is popular. Is concierge growing and is it impacting the availability of primary care to the general population or is it a good solution for people willing to pay a little extra for more time with a doctor? That's a good question. That's I think concierge, we're seeing it everywhere. Um, Can I take that one? Sure. <laughs> well, that's what I do as a circuit writer. The only difference is I bring it 
to the to the people, to the Medicaid population, to everyone, to the underserved working in a community health center. So I would say there's absolutely a pace, place for it, and it shouldn't just be for the rich. You know, the point of being able to healthcare coming to you, um, especially in settings where there's no other health care, that's a good thing. And um, and it shouldn't be again. You know, this is what Chris was saying earlier. You know, healthcare is a human right. Um, that's the reality. And, you know, that's the point. It should be accessible to everyone. And so in whatever style, you know, in different communities with different settings, uh, with different cultures fits best. And so again, though, I would just say, you know, back to Chris's point is that not to say that the funding resources shuffle. <laughs> so then as the funding resources shuffle to a style of medicine, then what happens? The workforce, just like we are talking about primary care, specialty care, that's what we've seen happen within primary care. If it becomes about, you know, this or that, what, what I would like to say is that this and that and whatever we need to do to make it work for the for the patient to be able to have that relationship. Uh, yeah, so uh, so I've been accused of that. You shouldn't be practicing concierge medicine. And I said, why? Because I'm not doing it for, for the rich folks. <laughs> yes. Well, <laughs> what usually what they're usually talking about with with uh, concierge medicine, though, is um, people paying an annual fee that can be up to five thousand dollars, you know, to so and, and then you get a doctor who can spend an hour or two with you and, and will, gives you their cell phone number and you can call them at any time. And um, it's appealing to it's I know it's great, but you're you're not that you're not getting paid a thousand dollars. Well, the MCO, the MCO gets paid. Yeah. And, and I bill. Yeah. Police, I, I, I would think of concierge as being the healthcare equivalent of private education, you know, and some people want to buy up and buy out. And how much inequity can we afford? I don't think we're going to, as as a country, we've shown a a, a real avoidance to one size fits all. And so we have to, I think we have to accept some inequity. I don't view, I view, I view concierge care as a symptom, not an, not an illness. And it may be an acceptable, we can live with it. I think they're bigger they're bigger issues. We're going to always have some people who are going to buy their way to the front of the line. Yeah. I just, I want to make sure the back of the line isn't too far back, you know? And so that's kind of my point. They have my cell phone number, my patients, I see them on Sundays. I see them, you know, you know, after mass, you know, that those types of things as well. The difference is they're not paying me directly, you know, but I do through this model, I get to bill their MCO. And so someone is still paying and so it's it's kind of level that playing field. Back to everybody deserves to have that relationship with their primary care provider. Um, yeah, it's uh, yeah, but there's always going to be. I love that example, Chris. Public versus private education. That's yeah. similar. So I, think, I have. I'm oh, sorry. Go ahead. Oh, I just wanted to say I think one of the issues that we're talking about is small smaller panel sizes, and I think that patients. Patients may not be able to express it in, in terms of panel size, but I think that that's what we're looking for here is for physicians or providers to have less patients that they're responsible for right now in order to sustain a practice in many settings, most settings, you have to see 30 patients a day in a fee-for-service environment and in order to keep the, the lights on. Um, and if you wanna take Medicaid or Medi-Cal in California uh, patients, then you need to only have that be a small part of your practice because you don't get paid as much for those patients. So there's these financial drivers that drive this sort of busyness in practice and this idea that physicians end up on a hamster wheel and patients are end up on a conveyor belt and that that um, people aren't having the relationship that they really wanna have. And I think that smaller panel size, which really means less patients per provider, which can happen when, when you're paying a bunch out of pocket or in it sounds like Matt in your model that that's working well too. Um, but that is not the majority of across the across the country. And I think the only the the not that only, but that one of the downsides of of this concierge practice is that what we're seeing is is providers. We don't have enough providers. And then people are sort of saying, I can't stay on this hamster wheel and I'm not happy in my situation. I'm gonna go create something outside of it, um, outside of the system uh, that works better for me, which is 
completely makes sense, but then we're losing more providers to that and we have an even greater workforce shortage. So. Okay, so I have a big question that I'd like you each to address to to wrap this up because we only have a few more minutes left. Um, it really stood out to me in um, Diane's presentation how much of these um, policies hinge on um, money from the federal government and cooperation with CMS I and mean, some of the innovations even originate with CMS. So we have a new administration coming in. What do you what do you think is going to happen? What are you what 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 are you worried about? What are you hopeful for? What what's next? So I'll I'll um take a shot at that, please. Um the core of why we have um the, the supply of physicians is is dwindling. Um and, and clinicians and primary care clinicians in general. I include NPs and PAs because we have the same problem with NPs and PAs, they have the same economic incentives to go into specialty care. The core of that is the Medicare fee schedule. Um, Medicare pays, the way Medicare values services is to pay specialty care a whole lot more than primary care. That's not the magic of the market. That's actually a bunch of advisors, the majority of whom are specialists who give Medicare advice. It's called the Relative Value Utilization Committee. And the commercial insurers have to follow Medicare signals. So, and, and again, I've been there. You, Whatever Medicare pays is what the reference is when the commercial insurers get out there. So the core of your question is, what are the prospects for Medicare physician fee reform? And there were starting to be, this has always come up, there actually were, sign, it's going to, most of the action is going to be in Congress, not in, in uh, uh, the executive branch, because it takes a, a um, uh, federal law to change the way that Medicare pays. And I don't, although people are concerned about what the effects of the new election, I think it's actually no worse and possibly better because um, uh, they're, uh, they're, I think people understand that the status quo isn't working. I think primary care is a bipartisan issue. And so um, I don't, I think the changes in control of Congress don't really make a difference for that. Sure. And and um, I'm not sure that um, big medicine is going to get any more sympathetic an ear from this administration than they did from the previous one. Really interesting. Diane? I would agree that primary care uh, is a bipartisan issue, and I'm hopeful about that. Um, I think that... that um, this access, you know, the title of this webinar is no one could see you now. And I think that that hits across red states and blue states and urban and rural and um, all different kinds of families and people at different income levels and de demographics. So I think this is a big enough crisis, if you will, that it, it affects enough people that it has become a bipartisan issue. I think the um, the solutions are somewhat complicated or somewhat complex. Um, and if it were an easy problem, it would be solved by now. Or if there was just one single bipartisan bill that could be passed or one single decision that could be made by the executive branch. Um, and so, uh, so that's just a fact. And I guess, um, I, I guess on the positive side, I would say I'm hearing interest in chronic illness management, which I think falls right under primary care. I th I'm hearing interest in prevention, which I think falls right under primary care. Um, I think that uh, there are opportunities like Chris ex explained. Um, I think my concern, if I have a worry, is about um, the application of evidence and science and um, the extent to which that's going to drive policy um, in this, this the coming years. Um, and I'm just hoping that we build on all the learning that we've had over time collectively across all states and in the federal government around what works to, to begin to fix primary care and um, that we're able to take bipartisan action on, on things that the evidence has shown um, are sort of the, you know, the, the ideal next steps. Matt, you're smiling, you have something to say. 
<laughs> what are you expecting from the new administration? Well, I think it's a wonderful perspective. Again, coming to me, I'm going to take it to the trench. And so I'll, I'll just jokingly say I'm looking forward that we're finally going to get our universal health care system. But, um, uh, you know, that, that's a joke. Um, here's where I am is that, you know, I, I once had to do an interview on somebody that lived through the Great Depression. I chose my grandfather and, uh, you know, he, he gave the interview in Spanish and all he kept talking about was el invierno malo, the bad winter, where half the livestock froze in position, standing up, all of that. He, you know, and I'd say the Great Depression, though, and, then, you know, on the end of it, he's like, eh, I kind of remember something about that. And I'm like, yeah, it was when people used to have to eat like beans and like, he's like, well, we always ate beans and, you know, so it didn't affect us any out here at the ranch. This is just life is normal. You know, the reality is it's neighbors helping neighbors, you know, and I love what Diane said. So I'm going to be with a smile on my face. I, I can't control any of that up here, up there, but I can do this. I can help my neighbors. And, and I love what she said, because she didn't say red or blue and rural or urban. No, she said red and blue, rural and urban. So it's going to be big and signals. Can this administration do it better than the last? I don't know. What will it change here at home? It'll just be people, neighbors taking care of neighbors and those relationships that have seen us through every crisis this uh, nation has ever undergone. That is a wonderful way to conclude. <laughs> Thank you, everyone. This has been a very instructive um, seminar and uh, webinar, but seminar. Uh, we've recorded it and the recording will be available um, to everyone who participated and everyone who missed it within, you know, a few hours. So thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank Keep you. up the good work, Matt. Thank Diane. Yeah. Partners, you too. Take care. Okay. Bye.